Good evening, and thank you for joining us. My name is Chrissy, and I would like to welcome you to the Doylestown Bookshop's virtual event series. I am very happy to welcome Philip William Stover and Jeff Adams, co-hosts of the Big Gay Fiction podcast, as they discuss The Beautiful Thing Shop, a romance set in New Hope, Pennsylvania. The authors will be in conversation for about a half hour, and we'll be taking questions throughout that time. If you would like to submit a question, please click on ask a question at the bottom of your screen and enter your question there. If you're watching from a phone or tablet, click the icon with a question mark to submit your questions. If you would like to purchase the book from the Doylestown Bookshop, click the button on, you, on your screen that says buy the book. We have curbside pickup available at both of our locations or we can ship the book to you. I've also had a few questions during past events from viewers who are accustomed to Zoom events. So to avoid any confusion, only our guests and myself will be able to participate through video and audio tonight. You may, however, interact with us through the chat box on your screen and, of course, through the Q&A. Now a little bit about our guests. Philip William Stover lives in Pipersville, Pennsylvania, shops at the Giant in Plumstonville, and works out at the Y in Doylestown, which is much more than I do. And he knows how hard it is to poke park in new hope on the weekends he's a clinical professor at new york university and has pub published multiple middle grade novels for simon and schuster he grew up tearing the covers off of romance novels he devoured so he wouldn't get teased at school now he would never consider defacing any of the books that he loves jeff adams is the co-host of the big gay fiction podcast a show for avid readers and passionate fans of gay romance fiction each week jeff and husband will nas bring listeners exclusive audio interviews and book recommendations jeff is also an author of gay romances including the hockey player's heart which he co-wrote with will hello and welcome thank you so much for joining us tonight hello hello thank you for having us you're welcome I'm going to pop off screen and let you get to it. So I am an unabashed fan of Philip's work. Uh, having loved The Hideaway Inn, it was one of our podcast top books of 2020. And now The Beautiful Thing Shop is out there. And I just, I devoured that and totally, totally loved it. Uh, before we dive I in, I just want to say I'm the only book on both of your lists and imagine how surprised I was when I found that out. I was scrolling and I was like, oh, that's nice. Jeff's on it. I'm totally happy. And I scroll. I'm like, oh, they, oh, I guess they accidentally didn't replace the image because it was there twice. So I was so thrilled. So thank you both for that. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're, you're very welcome. Thank you for that wonderful book. Uh, <laughs> Now, before we dive into talking about the Beautiful Thing Shop, for folks who don't know about the Seasons of New Hope series, tell us a little bit about that and what inspired you to set the series in New Hope. Well, I first the first time I came to New Hope as a child in the late 80s to play a munchkin in the Bucks County Playhouse production of The Wizard of Oz. And... Um, that was my first, my parents would drop me off for the matinees and pick me up at night after the second show. And I was a kid, um, I was uh, in between shows, we'd walk around town and I fell in love with it then. I knew it was a really special place and a place I wanted to return to at some point. And so when my husband and I were looking for uh, places to live outside of the city, this was definitely on our radar. And once we sort of discovered the area we've sort of slowly moved further away from the city he teaches at lehigh and we have a life here as my introduction says i shop at the the little giant we have two giants in the area one is very large and it's called the giant and then one is much smaller and we call that the little giant and we think that's hysterical that's like the best community joke you can make it's how you know somebody lives there because they can yeah. make that joke. <laughs> yeah. Is it big giant or little giant? Little giant. And then you laugh. Tell us about this series and 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 the, the kinds of stories you're telling in Seasons of New Hope. Well, I wanted to write a story that looked that was about a community and the sort of romances I read growing up. I loved Anne of Green Gables and the way that community rallied around Anne. And I 
never thought I would be able to live in a community like that. So I wanted to create it. And that's what I did with this series. The series has people, all different types of people experiencing different things who all care about each other and want the best out of each other and want to really connect and engage. And that's sort of why I wanted to set it here. I also love books that are set in seasons. So I wanted to do a winter and a summer because I wanted to have that feeling of being in a place. And that was really important to me. Mm -hmm. And I love how you've made this relatively small town so wildly diverse. It's one of the most diverse books, especially romance books that's out there. Cause it's not just, yes, it's diverse because it's an MM romance. So, you know, it has that already diversity built in it, but you've really made a landscape here of, all across, you know, the queer spectrum. And I think it, you've made about as diverse of a town as one could be. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. This is definitely, <laughs> I mean, that is, I am not unaware of that. This is a fantasy in that way, in a, in a wonderful way. And we talk about Bridgeton and how that sort of also has this universe of that. But in reality, it's sort of like the people I know in my life and the world I live in is actually not so different from the world of New Hope. And people ask me about the kind of, um, I don't know, what would you call it? The extreme diversity of that town. Uh, but that is what the life that I live here in Pennsylvania and in New York. So I really wanted to represent that. Although I do say something happens when you cross the bridge from New Jersey into New Hope that sort of changes you in that moment if you're going to enter this book. But I'm aware of that and that is 100% intentional. I like that you know, there's authors like yourself who create the world as they want it to be. I mean, you say you're living that kind of life, you know, there already, but you're also bringing into the world what you'd like to see overall. And, and that comes from, you know, I've written for a long time and there was a time to be completely honest where you couldn't do that in big publishing and not mm -hmm. with tweens. And there were times I was told explicitly, you have to change this character. You can't have one, you know, if you want to have success with this type of uh, publication and this type of group that will promote it, you can't do that. And when you're writing and you want your book to sell and you're in the middle of a contract, you have to make some really hard choices. I think that's really different now. But when I first started, that was part of the landscape, period. And it was definitely, as I got stronger and wrote for myself more, I was much less willing to change any of that. Mm -hmm. And I think we see the change a little bit. You know, you, you mentioned Bridgerton. Uh, Bridgerton's in the title of our presentation this evening. <laughs> uh, certainly when Bridgerton came to Netflix, we saw an expansion of you know, what was there already um, and, and bringing on so many people of color and tweaking the landscape, you, you know, the people, the colors and everything else to make it a story of now almost, even though it's set, you know, hundreds of years in the past. Right. And I, and I wanted to create that tapestry is probably the wrong word, but I wanted to create an experience of community where lots of different people were, could see themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now for those who know New Hope, what are they going to recognize out of your books? Because I already am disappointed to know from the first book, like the hideaway in doesn't really exist. The Logan in exists sort of. So it does sort of kind of, I mean, I tried to always make the landmarks real. So the playhouse exists and it's a landmark. Like if you were going to write about New York city, you might not change the name of the empire state building. Like it would probably still be the empire state building, but you might change the name of the coffee shop on the corner or something like that. And that's sort of the way I look at it. The bridges, the same and the, um, Oh, there are some moments like the quack shack. If anybody's from New Hope, they know there's a quack shack, which is where you can go to get food to pay the ge uh, to feed the geese. And I hate all forms of swans and geese. I think they are horrible creatures. And, uh, you know, I'm terrified of swans. And I wrote a scene in the Hideaway Inn where there's this real, you know, asshole of a swan. It's a goose, but they're same idea. Um, so uh, 
those are real things and there and there are bad swans in the world so that's real too <laughs> there are bad i mean swans I, if, there, if there are good swans please let me know show me a swan show me one nice swan and i will change my mind about them i i have yet <laughs> not to make one if anybody who's watching has one of those swans do let if us you have know a nice swan comment. let me know <laughs> here's your chance <laughs> Tell us about the beautiful thing shop, this brand new book that you've got, um, second in the series and set in winter. Winter. I really wanted to write a winter romance and I didn't want it to be centered around a holiday. I wanted it to be all purpose winter, I guess. Uh, so I moved it to January. So it really has snow and sledding and hot chocolate and all the types of wintry things that we love here. Um, and it's about two guys who have to share an antique shop. One is into retro vintage toys and lunch boxes and the Muppets and Smurfs and all of that type of stuff. And the other is a very serious 19th century connoisseur. And it's about their clashing um, aesthetics, but it's also about if you're from New Hope, this part of the book is a real place. There is a bank that is a mid-century bank and it is connected to a 19th century building. And they are, and I, I would go to New Hope and we'd walk around and I'd always think, those are, that's such an odd couple, those two buildings together. This 19th century bank and this, this mid-century bank with a drive-through is right next to it. It's this really weird thing. And that's actually what I started thinking about how those buildings are tied together. And that becomes a plot point in the book. Anyone who's from the area knows there is a big controversy right now about a parking deck being built in New Hope. And there's lots of conversations and debate about it. I did not know that, but if you're listening and there's a way I can capitalize on that with this book, I would love to know. I just haven't thought about it. Like if there's gonna be a protest, maybe I could sell the book at the protest or or something. Maybe one side will buy it. I, I don't I don't know. But I do know that controversy is going on right now. Yeah, and it's interesting, you know, like ripped from the headlines, except you didn't even know that was happening when you did it, which is no. kind of awesome. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I had no idea. And like lately I've been, you know, looking at the paper and there's, it's a heated debate over this. I probably shouldn't make light of it. I should make profit of it somehow. <laughs> I really love Danny and Prescott in this book because uh, not only do they sell very different things in the shop, they're about as opposite as opposite can get in terms of one's very easygoing, one is very uptight and very proper. How did you construct these characters? Where did where did Danny and Prescott come from for you? Well, I we have a very big mirror in our living room and I looked in it to see my relationship with my husband who would live in a stainless steel sink if he could and just wipe everything out at the end of the day. And I would like the entire house covered in cabbage roses, um, silk cabbage roses everywhere. So we are opposites <laughs> like that. Um, we often introduce ourselves as he is the nice one and I am the fun one. And people laugh at first and then they say, hey, you know what, that's pretty accurate. Um, so we are real opposites, but we came together and over 20 years, our styles actually have merged and um, we have found a way. But I think this idea of, you know, I love opposites attract because you think the thing you don't like is really the thing you kind of like. And that's what I wanted to write about. One of my favorite things you do in the story is, I mean, definitely at the beginning, they're both very much at odds with each other about how the store will be run and how things are going to work. And then there's that very sl slow transition of I'm standing my ground here because I'm supposed to, but I kind of don't want to, because I kind of like him. <laughs> Were those fun scenes to write <laughs> that ge gentle pulling back? Um, no. And I'll tell you why <laughs> as, as, as a writer, you know, this because you have to really make sure that line is, very, um, you have to be very careful with that line, especially in romance, which is a very specific genre. And if the character goes too far over each wet one way, it can be a mess. So that part's really hard. 
that said, it's really fun to write characters who kind of hold their ground and stick to it, but then also feel like maybe I shouldn't have done that because I feel that way all the time where I, you know, I'll, I'll get into an argument with those and be like, how could you possibly do that? And then I think, oh, well, that makes sense. But I'm not gonna let him know that <laughs> because that's not marriage. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I, I built on that. And you've also thrown in a lot of usage of forced proximity. I mean, this isn't a scenario where they're like they're snowed in or, you know, forced to share one bed or anything, but they're in such close quarters in that store that it's like you can't get away from each other without walking away from your business. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I knew I wanted to do something with forced proximity and I wanted to find a way and winter was really perfect for that because there's a wood stove and they're around it. They go sledding and have to hold on to each other. They, um, they do all things I do. They make pierogies at a church. Um, they go to a rummage sale. These are all things you could find me doing on any weekend, really. There's not a lot of, I mean, I wish the writing had more imagination in it. That's what I do. I go, I make pierogies and I go to rummage sales. So that's in the book. If you were stocking the beautiful thing store, what are you putting in it? Like if you have a wedge of that space, you know, cause I know you collect certain things. So what's oh, going yes. in your store if you're the proprietor? Well, I do have a thriving would be the wrong word, but thriving Etsy store. Um, and so when I was writing the book, if I needed the scene, I would go down to our basement where I keep everything on shelves and think, huh, what's one of the strangest things I own? And then that would make it into the book. Um, so my Etsy store is full of lovely, um, I have a lot of vintage linens, things that I can't actually use. Like how many vintage tablecloths can you have? <laughs> no, and that's, how if many anybody's in the chat, have? that's, I that's guess. not a rhetorical question. I want to know <laughs> how many can I have? Um, because my answer would be 142, but that's probably not the right answer. Um, so what I do is I, I really, I, I buy them and I resell them, but I have them for a little while and I really enjoy that. I love holding them and sending them off to someone who's going to love them more. So I would have lots of 50s vintage kitsch things. So you're more on Danny's side of the store, more than Presto. Oh yeah, oh <laughs> yeah. Who, yeah, I got 19th century stuff, no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> did you have to research to figure out what was on his side of the store? Or did you just oh, go to New yeah. Hope and see some of the antique stores there? I had to research when the 19th century started. Um, you know, I mean, all it was, I, I had to pick ideas from it. I um, know many historians at a university where I work. And so I was able to ask people some questions and things. And I was able to go to a lot of... Um, online auction sites and high end. We happen to live in Manhattan near an auction house that I could walk by all the time. And that was very inspiring. And I learned a lot about 19th century antiques, you know, and, and I know a lot of people who take that type of thing very, very seriously. And that's not how I think about my collectibles. I really think of them as fun. And like, if they're broken, eh, I don't care. Like, you know, if it's missing something, eh, that's fine by me. But I, so I wanted to think about that contrast too, about how people treat their collections differently. Like, mm -hmm. for example, my husband is the director of a museum and, you know, his relationship to objects is completely different than my relationship to objects. You know, he treats them with a different type of respect than I treat, treat mine. Mm -hmm. Now, Prescott and Danny both have the thing that is prized for them in this book, which just all the more sets up, you know, what their personalities are like. What's your prized possession in your collection? Well, I'll, I'm going to contradict everything I said about the 19th century because <laughs> my favorite object is a 19th century lamp. It's, it's called a slag lamp, which was a British lamp that looks kind of marbleized, almost stained glass. And they created these silhouettes, these scenes in it. Um, and the glass goes against it. So it looks like a sunset or a farm, these very beautiful things. You've seen them. And this is my prized possession because I got it super cheap. 
They put it in the window of the thrift shop on 3rd Avenue and 23rd Street as I was walking by. And as I'm walking by, I see her put it in the window and I'm late for class and I don't care. I walk in and I buy this lamp and it's like probably a $500 lamp I get for 70 bucks. I buy the lamp, I bring it home. Till this day, I have not taken the price tag off the lamp. Because when people come over, they say, oh, that's a nice lamp. And I take the price tag out and I say, look how much I paid for this lamp. <laughs> so that is what is my favorite object. And it's not just that it's beautiful. It's that I got it at such a good price. And I will never take that price tag off. That's one of the things, you know, for people who go and, and look for this kind of thing. It's it's about getting that steal. And it sounds like you definitely got a steal there. Yeah. Now you just need to put Smurfs on it. Oh, I had I've had my share of Smurfs. Believe me, that is all based on real life. I I collected Smurfs as a child, and they went everywhere. And I loved how they meandered around the store <laughs> to different places. They are everywhere, as they were when I was a child growing up. <laughs> they kind of found their way all over the house, much to my mother's chagrin. As you were writing Prescott and Danny, do you have a favorite scene, either you, either a favorite scene of Prescott's or Danny's or one of them together that was kind of your favorite or was like the most fun to write for you? I love, um, I like to write friendships. Like I like to write scenes where the friend sort of um, and if there are any friends here, they'll I, maybe I will just say I like to write scenes where the friend knows is able to see the other person more than they can see themselves, and reflecting that back to the friend helps them understand themselves or get through a problem. Like I love to write those scenes, and Arthur does that with both Danny and Prescott. Mm -hmm. He sort of is able to see beyond what they can see and what they're where they're stuck and where they're limited and he does it in this incredibly i think loving and generous way of not telling them oh you you're so wrong you don't understand anything but telling them you look look keep looking we'll see more go deeper understand more and that's i love to write the, those scenes are fun mm -hmm. and you could tell that you have a good time with them because I mean, Arthur is certainly one of the more forward-facing of those characters in this book. But the entire town who embrace Prescott and Danny gently move them in the right direction without, you know, beating them over the head about you should go do this thing. Yeah. I mean, and I wanted to write the community as a character. You know, I won't give away the ending of this book. But that last scene where the community is, you know, chanting for them is really the, the book I wanted to write. Like that was always in my head. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the things that I love about your brand of small town romance. It's the community is strong. The community is vibrant. There are so many elements to it. You know, you, you don't really scratch, you don't go surface level on any of it. Uh, well, you know, I really wanted to write small town romances. I've written books that take place in the city where I'm living and I really, in the Hideaway Inn, there is a scene that takes place at the Tinicum Arts Festival, which is on the 4th of July in the book, but here it's after the 4th of July. And this is a festival I've gone to my with my husband for years, and it's really lovely and very beautiful. And I remember I grew up going to these things with my parents, and I remember being a gay kid and thinking, oh, I love this so much. One day, I'll have to leave it. One day there won't be a place for me here. And I wanted it. Like I wanted to go to like county fairs and things, but I knew I, I, I felt that if I wanted to be gay and be in the world and find love and have a career, it couldn't happen here because I was gay and, and probably for other reasons. And that was, I've always, always missed that part of my life. So when I was able to return, and in that book, the character does return and looks at the small town and thinks, maybe things have changed, like maybe the frame for what we think of as a small town has shifted just a little bit. And that's what I think about with Bridgerton and these changes, like the places where we, where I thought I was excluded, maybe there's a place again, I, I'm not sure, but it's, 
I wanted to write about the reconciliation of that, of like what it means to return to that in ways that you never thought you could growing up. Mm -hmm. And that's really effective with Vince in the hideaway in, because there's not just his journey to finding his happily ever with tack, but it's really becoming more himself and coming and finding the happily ever after with the town again, right. essentially. Yeah. And, and finding a way back to that. And also finding, I, I like to write about gay characters who struggle with finding their place in the world and finding a place with themselves. And, and Danny has this also, he's, you know, I don't know if I can say this because I wrote it, but I think he's funny. Um, so, you know, he, he talks about being funny as a way of protecting himself from the world, mm -hmm. but also how when you do that for a long time in your life, it no longer becomes a choice. It's just how you are in the world. And I want to write about characters who sort of begin to question that, like, is this how I am because I want to be this way? Or is this how I've been in the world because I'm protecting myself? And Vince in The Hideaway Inn is really struggling with that. Yeah, he's got a lot of armor when he shows up in he New does. Hope. Yeah. And it's good to see these types of stories, right? Because representation matters, of course, um, as we've already talked about a little bit, but projecting these things for other people to see, either to see themselves or someone who they may know or aspects of family they may see in these books and seeing that diversity across romance now is so incredible. Right, I mean, there's so much, you know, so much of that is changing. And also there's diversity and there's own voices. And those are paths in the wood that sometimes diverge and sometimes don't. And sometimes they are helping each other and sometimes they're going in opposite directions, it seems, but they are, they are sisters. And um, we're still navigating and figuring that out. But I really wanted to write stories about authentic gay male experiences that I know of. So in The Beautiful Thing Shop, Prescott, who's the 19th century connoisseur, talks about um, expertise and how uh, expertise is something that gave him power and made him feel safe. I have a beloved friend who's also a first reader. And at one point she was reading some of the romances and said, oh, all your characters want the same thing. They always want to be safe. And I was like, oh yeah, that's a thing for like, as a gay guy growing up, like that's a big thing because if you're not safe, you don't feel like you can do the next thing. So my characters are always finding ways to be safe. And I think that's such an, for me, that's an authentic part of coming into my own. Mm -hmm. And the feeling, the, the need to be safe. I mean, I think we see that through so many aspects of society these days, the need to be safe and also to be seen. Yeah, to, to be, and the tension between being safe and being seen for, and that's what happens in these books. For me as a child, being safe meant not being seen or controlling how I was seen by being seen as funny or something, mm -hmm. but being, you know, so then you move to being an adult and being seen and being safe at the same time is sort of the goal. And sometimes I get there and sometimes I don't. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I want to remind the folks who are, who are watching definitely, you know, feed your questions into that uh, questions box. Cause we're, we're definitely happy to take your questions uh, and and find out even more from Philip than what than what I'm going to talk to him about. <laughs> I mean, Jeff and I could talk for hours, but we'll we'll stop eventually. We really could. <laughs> uh, let's talk a little bit more about the Hideaway Inn. Uh, we've talked, uh, we've kind of hinted around it a little bit, where we've got you know Vince coming back, buying the inn in order to flip it but then figuring out he kind of maybe wants to stay in New Hope. Uh, and the delightful sort of second chancy story with Tack. I mean, this story just melted my heart in so many ways, uh, partially because of how Vince gets to you know lose his armor through that. How would you kind of characterize the hideaway in and what that story is uh, to help people go backwards to that book if they haven't read it yet? 
Yeah, I mean, you can read these in any order, of course, um, because they are separate contained stories. In that book, I you hit it, you hit the nail on the head. I think of that book about a guy who loses his armor, who thinks, I oh, I say the inspiration for that book was the um, purple panes, the lavender panes in Boston, which are these. Uh, glass windows in the 19th century. Here I go with the 19th century again. I just dissed it and now this is my second <laughs> 19th century reference. I, You can't trust me, you can't trust me. So anyway, in Boston, there are these window panes and they had this imperfection um, where oxygen or something got in and they were shipped over from Europe and they turned to lavender and they were considered an imperfection and they people were like, they wanted them returned to the store or whatever, but then people started craving them. They started thinking they were beautiful instead of something to be rejected. And I went on a tour and learned this history of those windows. And I always wanted to write a story about somebody who thinks the thing about them is wrong is actually the thing that is lovable. And Vince tries to protect and cover up all of the softness in himself. And what he realizes is that what you have to do is actually let that part show so that you can be loved. Are, there's a um, lots of James Baldwin in that and uh, the fires next time and the idea of the mask and how it prevents us from connecting. And that's what that book is about. So Vince is this big kind of alpha who kind of comes in all tough, not gonna, and, and this is, I you know, I totally relate to this. Not that I'm a big, strong alpha, obviously, if you've listened to <laughs> No, that's not true. But I sort of know that when I was coming into my own as an adult, I would sometimes go into situations and I would be so incredibly, like I'd be intense and tough and I wouldn't let anyone take advantage of me because when you get the beaten out of you as a kid and you become an adult, you sort of stand up and say, I'm not gonna let anybody do that anymore. And I was very tough like that and hard edged you know, in my 20s, until you sort of realize that, okay, you don't have to always be so incredibly difficult. Now, I am still incredibly difficult, but it's for very different reasons. <laughs> and and Tex got his own kind of journey too, almost that he went on before Vince got there. Yeah, Tack kind of finds his way. He's a guy who you know, really needed to find himself and go through a marriage to sort of come out on the other side. But a guy who's always been sweet and connected and needed someone like Vince to feel whole and feel like he was capable to. Mm -hmm. Also, he's a chef in that book. And who doesn't like to write about food? That book made me hungry occasionally. There's a lot of food the in that book. That, you know, the tack was creating at the end. Uh <laughs> There's a lot of goat cheese in that book and a lot of goats. We live next door to goats. Um, so that's probably why they are there. I did enjoy the the visit to the to the farm in that book. Yes. I, I mean, I, I wanted to make sure there were lots of animals in that book and the farm. And the farm is based on the farms here that we have that are really beautiful and that I always, you know, really drew me into the area. One day I'm going to come there and I want a tour. <laughs> You know, it's a really beautiful spot. New Hope is famous for being sort of halfway between Philadelphia and New York City. It has a sort of mix of those cultures. It is like Fire Island or places like that that were had a history of being um, gay and all, have lots of alternative people in them. Um, this area was known as the Genius Belt for a long time. We have Dorothy Parker and um, lots of uh, uh, Michener's house was not far from where our house was. There is a lot of culture and art here. And it's a place where people are really able to create things. We've got a question uh, from one of our viewers. Uh, can you talk about Jules and the Hideaway Inn? Uh, because they love them so much. Oh, Jules is the child of tack in that book and a child who is figuring out who they are and this book has a lot to do with ideas of masculinity and gender what it means to I mean, this is really when i wrote the hideaway and i really thought of it about a book that's about what it means to be a man and to be in love 
And where our notions of that come from? How do we know what it is to be a man? And how do gay men know what it is to be a man? Because we often, um, you know, we live in a culture of gay men that can be hypersexualized, that can be hyper um, masculinized, and finding our way through that is hard. And Jules is a child who is. Uh, figuring out their gender identity, but doing it on their own terms without any of the hangups that the adult characters have. And I wanted to write a child that sort of balances the struggle of the others. And I wanted um, uh, Vince to see that. When I was, once my husband and I were at university and lived in a dorm, and once we asked the this kid who was gay and uh, was telling us about his major and we're like, oh, what are you gonna do? And he was like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna be a surgeon. And afterwards we went home and we were like, did that strike you as like really interesting? And we were both like, yeah, because when we were gay, the idea of being a surgeon would have meant like a very sort of, a much more challenging path in mm -hmm. that it was a very male dominated field and being gay in that would have been an issue. It just would have been like we went in like he works in the arts i you know work in the arts we kind of found these fields where we're very happy but i was so struck by this a generation that does that and uh, that's where and there are other you know and my, my students have always inspired me like that especially because i think wow that must be such an interesting you know generation to be in and so mm -hmm. jules was really inspired by that um I don't know if braveness is the right word, but that freedom, that freedom, and that's who Jules is. Yeah, I, I absolutely adored Jules also in that book. Uh, just a ray of light and sunshine every time you saw them. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, uh, I wanted them to be super fun. I would love to see 15 years from now, like what Jules' love story turns out to be, <laughs> you know? <laughs> who his artificial intelligence romance who their artificial intelligence romance is yeah um no he could be a, a real <laughs> 15 guy years, or girl okay. yeah or whether they get a real guy or girl you know okay. whatever <laughs> that could happen as you put it in, in in your bio you write books for tweens teens and drama queens which i think is an amazing turn of phrase what's got you writing across so many genres um, well, I say tweens, teens, and drama queens, but I think of that all as just one person um, because I have it all inside me. I started writing for tweens after ghosting for a best-selling women's fiction author, and I took the book that we were working on and turned it into my first tween book. I didn't really know much about it, but, um, you know, the characters are figuring out who they are. They are really concerned about what other people think about them. And they are worried about what will happen next. That's exactly how I feel. So it was a really good fit for me. And um, that type of seventh grade um, locale, I felt really comfortable in. I wrote my tween books as first person female. And when I started finding out about gay romance, I was like, oh, let's see what it's like to write from my own perspective. And, you know, it was no different. I, I am a tween girl on the inside and my tween girls are like bitter middle-aged gay men. So they're the same. <laughs> and another question from the audience, is there any advice you would give to aspiring writers? Um, I teach writing uh, at NYU, and I think the, um, you know, I guess sometimes I give very specific advice, which is actually the advice I'm going to give. I think for aspiring writers and all writers, really, the thing we have to practice all the time is being specific and what that means. So that means narrowing by time and space, which is like, instead of writing about like the street was beautiful, try to find the smaller detail about the tree on the street and that leaf on the street and what that looks like and to really see that. And instead of writing about the lunch, like when I was in tween stuff, the lunch was terrible in school. You write, I try to write about the pizza we had on the Friday that made me throw up 
was a terrible meal, right? But that's so hard and I do it in my own writing all the time. I get really kind of the idea out, but then I have to go down and deepen. And I think for all writers to change your focus of observation from looking at the world in a very large way, but to look at the parts and how they connect to the whole. And I think that was what makes a good artist and a good writer. But I could I be wrong, answer. so I don't know. No, yeah. I, I think it's a, a, a really, as a writer myself, I think that's some really solid, right on point advice. And, and I tell my students, it's like yoga. Like you, the more you practice that type of careful observation, the better you get at it. So like when I start with yoga, I can't touch my knees. and But then I can touch my knees and then my toes and then the floor. You start looking and your vision gets more specific and more specific and more specific. Mm-hmm. Last chance for uh, audience questions. If you've got any, please get those in. Um, what is a book you've read recently that you would recommend to everyone watching? Um, so I just uh, read, I read two great books. One, because I can't remember the name. I'll have to look it up on my other book. Um, the Phil, is it Prescott? No, it's not Prescott. That's the other name. Um, as long as, as far as you'll take me. Do you know this book? I don't Phil, know that Sta- Phil Stamper. It's Phil Stamper. That's who it is. Um, I love that. It's about a gay kid who goes to London and it deals with music. I know nothing about music. Like I can't hear any notes. Um, I, uh, you know, I can't sing or really play anything. But this book is about being in a very sort of um, high level orchestra and about his relationships and romances. And I just read uh, the Iden. Aiden series in uh, Blake Allwood's books that are really, really great. So I, I love all of those. That's oh, and Kathy Lee Gifford has a new memoir, which I also loved, but that's different. <laughs> that's a relevant book that you can share that you've enjoyed recently. I, I grew up watching Kathy Lee on TV. I'm sorry. I'm not going to be sorry for uh, still being interested in her. So, yeah. yes. Absolutely. As we kind of look to wrap up here, uh, how can people keep up with you online? Um, well, I'm mostly on Instagram at Philip William Stover, and I post lots of pictures of my dog and lots of pictures of Bucks County because that's where I am all the time now. Um, and uh, we take a long hike every morning with the dog, and I snap photos there, and I also share upcoming things about my books. I've enjoyed the trips through Bucks County that I've had, especially the snow. I'm out here on the West Coast where I'm not having snow. I get rain. Oh. And so I've enjoyed the pictures of your <laughs> lovely blankets of snow. Now we have snow with a sheet of ice over it, which That's is very so nice. nice. <laughs> and then on top of that, sometimes you fall through it and you tent pole on the dog walk. So it's it's pretty, but it's becoming treacherous. <laughs> well, be safe. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like to thank you both so much for joining us tonight. I really enjoyed your conversation, and I hope that when we can do in-person events again, Philip, you'd come and join us, and maybe if we're lucky, Jeff would be in Pennsylvania. We'd love to have you, too. I'll show you around to the Little Giant. You'll get a kick right. out of You it. have to go to the Little Giant. <laughs> you have to go to the Little Giant. It's our first stop, that's, our first stop. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, if I'm ever if I'm ever there, I'm going to have to come to your bookstore too because I love a good bookstore. Oh, so. it's a great bookstore. Please, please do. Yes. Well, thank you again. I hope uh, I'd like to thank everyone for watching. Uh, this event will be available to view again on our YouTube channel at Doyle's Time Bookshop and here on Crowdcast. Thank you both again. Thank you everyone for watching. And Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody.